Starting where we left off last time, physics. The first obvious thing that we need to add is gravity because, well, right now we're kind of floating in midair. So let's remove where we were setting the velocity to zero because in real life we don't actually instantly stop in place. Then let's make a constant acceleration vector which is just Minecraft's gravity constant pointing downwards. As you can see at 32 meters per second square, it's quite a bit more than in real life where it's about a third of that. Add that to the velocity vector and gravity should just work. Let's do jumping now. We obviously only want to jump if the player is on the ground. So let's add a grounded attribute and set it when the collision normal vector is pointing upwards. All jumping is, is an upwards velocity impulse, but here, here's a snag. We want to jump a certain height, sure, but how do we know what velocity impulse is going to net us that certain height? Now, I could just give you this magical velocity constant, but where's the fun in that? To find it out, we're going to have to use a little bit of calculus. Oh, come on, mate. No, no, it's okay. It's really going to be super, super simple stuff. As long as you follow the Calc 2 course or equivalent, you should honestly be 100% fine. We know our acceleration at any moment is our gravity constant, which I'll call g. Integrating this, we get the velocity v of t at a given time, which as you can see is a linear function shifted up or down by this constant initial velocity. Integrating this yet again, we get the distance, or as it is in our case, the height y of t traveled at a given time. The second constant here can be ignored because we don't really care about the height we start our jump at. Predictably, this looks like a parabola, which traces out our jump. One thing I'd like to bring your attention to is that initial velocity constant. As you can see, changing it affects how high we jump, so that's actually the initial velocity impulse we were looking for. We want the maximum of this function to be our jump height, obviously, so we want both y of t equal to j and v of t is derivative equal to zero. Plop those two into a system of equations, solve the velocity equation for time, substitute that into the height equation, and finally solve for the initial velocity. We end up with an initial velocity of the square root of negative two times g times the jump height. Plugging that initial velocity into our height equation and graphing it, you can visually see that the effect each parameter has makes perfect intuitive sense. If we make it so that pressing space makes us jump, we can see that makes us jump about the height that we specified. Cool. Currently, we're changing the velocity directly on inputs, which is not very cash money. So add an acceleration vector to entity, which can be set in the player's update function depending on the speed, instead of setting the velocity or adding to the position. We must also add this acceleration vector to the velocity in entity's update function and reset it once we're done. Now if we try to move around, you'll notice it's the same problem as when we weren't yet setting the velocity to zero, where we slide around the place. But this time, because we're setting the acceleration instead of the velocity, eh, uh, no, it's humorous, it's funny. To mitigate this, we can add a friction force to counteract the increase in velocity. This friction depends on a few different factors such as whether or not we're grounded, falling, jumping, or flying. The reason we have a different drag value for when we're jumping is so that we don't have to account for it in our jump height calculation as I fruitlessly <laughs> attempted to do. We can add a friction property to entity to give us the right friction depending on these factors. Finally, after we've applied the gravity acceleration, let's subtract the velocity times the friction coefficient from the velocity. We don't want to overshoot this, so make sure to take the minimum between the current velocity and the velocity times the friction coefficient before subtracting. Running this, we see that the player moves very slowly. That's because we're not adjusting the input acceleration based on the friction, so we're always going to move slower than the speed that we want. But that's exactly what we don't want. We'd like the velocity to be a set target that we reach regardless of what the friction coefficient currently is. So let's bust out the differential equations to work out how we do this. This is going to take a while, so if you're not very comfortable with differential equations, I recommend you to skip over this and come back once you are comfortable with them. I have a bunch of awesome resources you can learn from linked in the description, which you can uh, learn from. First step is to model our situation here. I'm going to be using Leibniz notation throughout because it's simply superior and no one can convince me otherwise. So we know that our change in velocity over change in time, which you'll notice is the same thing as the acceleration, is going to be the input acceleration subtracted by the friction coefficient, which I'll denote with the Greek letter mu, multiplied by the velocity. Rearranging this a bit, we get the canonical form of a simple first order linear differential equation. So we know we'll need an integrating factor to solve for v here, which is nothing but e to the power of the integral of mu with respect to t, which is e to the power of mu t. I won't prove this here, but there are excellent videos I linked in the description which do. Let's now multiply everything by the integrating factor and integrate each side to find v. For this first integral, we can use integration by parts. Integrating dv dt is trivial, so as differentiating e to the mu t, so we end up with this rather large expression which still has an integral, but hey, look, this actually cancels out our second integral. Then for the third integral, we can do this in our heads. This gets us i over mu times e to the mu t plus c. Right, so divide out e to the mu t on both sides to isolate v, and we get this pretty awkward expression. This c term and all the junk that it multiplies is a bit annoying to deal with, so it'd be nice if we could find a way to make this all just disappear. When you've got complicated stuff like this, it's sometimes useful to take a step back and ask yourself what exactly you're trying to achieve. What we want is a certain value for i such that v of t eventually ends up equaling a fixed velocity v max as time tends towards positive infinity. So, well, let's make time tends towards positive infinity and plugging it into our second term, our exponent tends towards negative infinity, which makes the exponential tend towards zero, which makes the 
whole term tend towards zero, which is great. You can see this graphically where changing the value of C initially has a large impact on our function, but progressively this impact becomes less and less important, irrespective of the value of C. Limits are great, aren't they? Anyway, let's rearrange this to find that our acceleration should be our target velocity times the friction coefficient. And this makes a lot of sense when you look back to our original equation. If we think about what happens when time goes to infinity, the acceleration equals zero and V of T equals V max. So the input acceleration is indeed equal to mu times V max. Overall, the solution is frankly quite comically simple. Just multiply the input acceleration by the friction coefficient here, and now we're moving at the correct speed. Also, I'm not going to detail the code here because it's pretty trivial stuff, but I added a few extra keys such as R for resetting the player's position and F for toggling flying on or off. And well, that's all folks. As per the poll on my Discord server, the next episode will be about mobs.